There's something strange in this neighborhood. Don't look good. No. Who are you gonna call? A really cheap film cash in. I loved the Ghostbusters, I loved everything about them. The film, the toys, the cartoon, everything. So when my mum told me that there was a Ghostbusters computer game and it was out on the Amstrad CPC, the computer I'd just been given recently, I knew I was saving up my pocket money to go and get that game. It was the first computer game I ever bought. It was the first one to be added to my tiny collection of games that came packaged with the computer. And it was also the first time that I was really, really disappointed with a purchase. So you can imagine how I felt when I loaded it up and this is what I saw. See that? That big Ghostbusters in bright red? That's as close to a title screen as my Amstrad CPC version got. No famous logo for me. Activision got a nice big logo, but the game itself? No chance. Not unless you bought the full price version anyway. That version got a big logo. But if you want the good version of that picture, you'd better not have forked out the extra for a copy on disc, because that version has a terrible rendition of the logo. Although it does have a proper ending, and no screen flicker since it's loading everything off disc in chunks instead of having to load the whole game in 64k of memory. Why three CPC versions? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, sure, okay, when this game was released, the CPC664 disc computer had just come out, and sure, the developers may have wanted to take advantage of the new system and its resources, but three versions? It doesn't seem to make sense. Why would you go back and change code for your budget re-release? Surely the point of a budget re-release is that you're making a little bit of extra money quickly of code you've already got. It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Now every version gets the infamous karaoke sequence. I'm hard pressed to decide which version is better, the C64 or the CPC version. The C64 has its usual decent quality audio, but it sounds like it's missing something in my view. The CPC version on the other hand is a decent rendition of the original theme and it manages to capture a lot more of the spirit of the original tune even if the bass line is lacking, as is unfortunately so common on the CPC. It's jaunty, and it's fun, at least at first. But it is all you'll hear throughout the game, so after a while, any version is going to get repetitive. But regardless of whether you prefer the CPC or the C64 version, we can all agree the beeper tune the Spectrum got is awful. Still, at least they got an attempt at the logo, I suppose. So, after we're subjected to a terrible rendition of the theme tune, what we get next is blessed silence, interspersed by beeping every time a character comes up on the screen. And I don't mean character as in person, I mean character as in letter, punctuation, or number. And there are a lot of letters. This slow procession of business management tedium gives you a glimpse at the game as it's going to pan out from here on in. Enjoy it folks, it doesn't get any better than this. Seriously, it doesn't get any better than this. This game sucks. So you put your name in, which many years later I discovered was the way that you input a cheat code in this game. I never knew a cheat code for the CPC version, and actually I still don't, because the internet only records the C64 and Spectrum versions, rather than the codes for my beloved CPC. But once you've got that over with, you get to pick your car, and then your equipment, in a tedious manner by picking up equipment with a forklift and moving it onto your car. Now don't overload your car and choose wisely in what you pick up, because once you've got it, you can't unget it. It really is easy to screw over your game at this point. There are several items you'll never be able to afford, just as there are several cars you'll never be able to afford. You also can't come back here and buy a better car later, because there's no shop location in these versions of the game. For that, you'll need to play the NES version like nobody I ever knew as a kid. Okay, so now that's over with, we can bust some ghosts, right? Well, not quite. After buying all the stuff, you'll need to play the game. And I hope you did buy all the stuff you need, because you can't restock on stuff that you forgot. You're presented with this screen. It's the main screen of the game, and you'll be seeing it a lot. Here you move the Ghostbusters logo around between buildings, patrolling streets until one of the buildings flashes red. When that happens, move over to it so you're either directly above or below the building, then push the joystick in the direction of the building and press the fire button. Yes, I said joystick. You can't play this on the keyboard, because apparently that's asking too much. You'll then be presented with the driving screen, which is where you get to actually see the car that you bought earlier on. 
You can move it left and right by steering left and right, but there's not really not much point, not unless you drove over some ghosts on the main screen, because then they'll turn up here. This is apparently a simulation of you driving to the building from your HQ, and the time it takes to get there will depend on how far you've moved on the main screen since you last went to a building. Why the developers felt the need to add this to the game when you've already simulated driving by moving your logo to the building is beyond me. Maybe there was supposed to be more to this section but they ran out of time? I don't know. Anyway, if you draw over any ghosts on the way to the building, you get to suck them off with a ghost vacuum. And yeah, I don't know what the point of this is either. I'm assuming that it scores you extra points or it was supposed to do something better in the game but they ran out of time. But either way, I've been playing this for 30 years and I still don't see a point. So suck away if you want, but or don't suck if you don't want to. There's really not much difference. Once you've driven to your target building, you finally get to bust a ghost. Two of your three guys will fly diagonally into the sky after you've placed them in your desired position on the screen. They will not change the direction they fire in, and you will only ever see two of your three guys, because apparently using all three at once would overtax the computer or something. Also, both guys look exactly the same, because there's only one human sprite in this whole game. Well, that's one way to save our memory, I suppose. This ghost moves randomly, and you only get one shot to get this right, but if you do, and you line your guys up perfectly, then you can put them into a triangle of streams, which will trap the ghost underneath, and then you get a better chance of getting it into the trap. However, you've got to time it perfectly, because if you miss, you can't move your guys backwards, only forwards, and that means your ghost will be trapped outside your triangle of streams, and you won't be able to get it into your trap. Well, not unless you've got dumb luck. Once the ghost is directly over the trap, press the fire button. The trap will spring and, hopefully, the ghost will be caught. Then you get to hear the only other piece of sound in the game aside from the theme tune, a digitised bit of speech, with the ghost shouting <coughs> That's not bad for a game written when home computers were still in their infancy, and especially impressive given that the ZX Spectrum only had a beeper available at the time rather than an actual sound chip. If you caught the ghost, you'll get some money and one of your traps is used up. If you didn't, one of your guys gets slimed and you can't use him until you get him cleaned up. If you still have a trap and a spare guy available, you could go and bust another ghost, providing there's a building flashing red, but if you don't have men or traps, you need to head back to headquarters to freshen up. Once again, you get to drive, and once again, you can suck up ghosts if you feel like it, or you can ignore them if you're like me and you just can't be bothered. It really gets quite repetitive, but you'll be doing this an awful lot. When you arrive at Ghostbusters HQ, you get a quick animation of the three guys running into the car. After that, it's back to the main screen for more wandering about and more busting ghosts. Rinse and repeat until the Marshmallow Man attacks. When the Marshmallow Man attacks, the four yellow ghosts that keep flooding into the Zool building turn into four quarters of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. He then assembles, tramples a building, and you lose $4,000 if you don't stop him. If you bought the Stay Puft bait item from the shop at the start of the game, you can lure him away from buildings and thus prevent an attack, which earns you money. But I don't bother, however, because it's not that important. Now, the controls to lure him aren't that bad. You basically you stand in the street and you press a fire button to lure him away from a building, and then you get $4,000 or so for stopping a marshmallow attack, and that's great! providing you can be bothered or yet you actually bought the marshmallow food in the first place. But if you didn't, then don't worry about it because the building there will still flash red and you'll still get everything about it. It still classes as a building in the game. There's no actual detriment. All you do is you lose $4,000, which to be honest with you, you can get back in one or two ghost catches and you will get a lot of ghost catches at this point in the game because the, when the PK meter goes up, so do the number of flashing buildings. There is no detriment. This part of the game appears to be so massively rushed that there is actually no downside to not bothering. And that's it. That's all there is to this game. Drive to the haunted building, bust a ghost, drive to HQ and drop the ghost off, maybe deal with a marshmallow man once in a while, then rinse and repeat. It's about three to four minutes of gameplay, repeated ad nauseum over 45 to 50 minutes of game time. Yes, that's right. Three or four minutes of gameplay stretched out to nearly an hour. Hope you feel like you got your money's worth. Finally, the PK meter will turn to 9999 on the bottom of the screen, and you'll be told to drive to the Zool building to defeat Goza. Now, on the NES version, there was a lot of stairs that you had to climb up, and it was very, very annoying because it was quite a frustrating process. You'll be glad to hear that you don't have to do that on this version. Instead, you're treated to a pathetically easy final sequence. You need to sneak a man past a bouncing Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. 
If you get a guy past him and into the building, you automatically defeat Goza. The Marshmallow Man will not chase you. He won't do anything but bounce up and down and up and down and up and down. That's all he does. And if you time it right, it's very easy to get all three men right past him. But even if you get one past him and you're very lucky, you'll get treated to some limited animation of your firing your proton packs at Goza. Woohoo! If you aren't lucky, you get a bright orange screen with some text on it, telling you that you've defeated Goza and saved the world. You'll also get this screen even if you did see a bit of limited animation, so don't feel left out. Here you get a bank account number that you're supposed to write down, because it lets you start the game again with the same amount of money that you earned in this playthrough. Now that's a nice touch of giving a little bit of replay value by giving you a reward that allows you to buy better cars, more equipment, things like that. But here's the thing, it doesn't actually make you want to replay the game because you've seen everything already. There is no additional fun to be had, there's no extra bits, it's just the same again, only now you've got a different shaped car and maybe a few more traps. And also, the extra equipment that you couldn't afford the first time through, if you can afford that now, all that does is reduce the amount of time you have to go back to the HQ to empty your traps. Yes, that's right, there is a piece of equipment in this game that means that you have to play the game less. You have less to do, more boredom. That's not good replay value, I'm sorry. It's a poor cash in and you can get an awful lot more entertainment by drawing a picture, a stick figure, of people busting ghosts. Seriously, it's not a good game, it's a quick tie-in, and if it wasn't Ghostbusters, we'd be hating on this an awful lot more. It's not fun, I'm sure. We played it when we were kids, because it was Ghostbusters and we were kids, and it kept us entertained then, but if you're coming back to it now, the only reason that you would come to it now is for nostalgia value, for how you spent your youth. If you're coming to it fresh, there's not enough here to actually warrant your attention. Go elsewhere guys, there's more fun to be had with other things. Okay, that's really all I've got time for this week, so thank you very much for watching, I hope you did like this, and if you did, remember to click the like button, share it with your friends so that they know a good game when they see it, and do subscribe for future videos because there will be more in the future, but until next time, I've been Zoe Kirk Robinson, you've been watching Game Hammer, and I'll see you next time.